Amen. All right, well, let's take our Bibles this evening and uh, turn to the book of 2 Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles, and uh, chapter number 30. 2 Chronicles, chapter number 30, on Sunday evening, we have been uh, studying the life of King Hezekiah. And uh, Hezekiah comes at a time, as we've been uh, reading, that was uh, not a good time in as far as in the history of Israel, uh, the northern kingdom is about to be taken captive. And um, after the first three kings over Israel, Saul was the first one who reigned for 40 years. And um, David was the second one who reigned for over 40 years. And Solomon, David's son, reigned for 40 years as well. And after Solomon, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam split the kingdom. And from that time on, uh, you have the northern kingdom, which is comprised of the ten tribes in the north, and uh, the southern kingdom, which is Judah and Benjamin in the south. And uh, so far as we read, the northern kingdom had 19 kings, and out of 19 kings, every single one of them was evil. In the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, uh, there were also 19 kings uh, during the history of Israel there. And out of the 19, it's debatable, but three or possibly four were considered good kings. So when Hezekiah comes on the scene, during his reign, the northern kingdom is going to be taken into captivity after 19 kings. So this is not right after Solomon. It's been quite some time, a number of years now, that we've seen uh, the uh, southern kingdom go on. And Hezekiah comes after Ahaz. And Ahaz, as we've been already studying, was a very evil king. He is the one that closed up the temple. He is the one that built high places where people could worship false gods. He is the one that built altars in every corner in Jerusalem. Bad king. Very wicked king. We also know that Ahaz offered some of his own sons and daughters as sacrifices to false gods. He even went uh, up north and saw some of the heathen worship and he saw an altar that he liked. A worldly altar, he brought it back into the temple of God and said, Replace the altar of the Lord, bring this pagan altar here, and let's offer the sacrifice of God on this pagan altar. Where Hezekiah comes on the scene and God has spared his life because he hasn't been sacrificed as many of his brothers and sisters. And he comes on the scene and we saw that he was a man that was approved of God. He was a man that, uh, that was seeking for sanctification and for cleansing. And we saw that he was a godly man who influenced the nation of Israel back into a proper place of worship and offering the proper sacrifices. He had all the priests and the Levites. By the way, the temple was shut when Hezekiah comes on the scene. Nobody was worshiping God. None of the priests and the Levites were in the temple doing, the, doing their daily duties. It's a bad scene. But Hezekiah comes on the scene and everything changes. Now we come to 2 Chronicles chapter 30 and we'll begin reading in verse 1 here, but... Hezekiah is continuing his reform, if you would, to bring back the nation of Judah to a place that it previously was. Notice in verse 1, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they, would, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Israel to keep the Passover in the second month. So think about it here. The Passover is quite a significant feast. We understand that uh, for the nation of Israel. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. But when Hezekiah comes on the scene, Israel has not been observing the Passover. The Bible says in verse 3, And they could not keep it at that time, because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a degree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not done it for a long time, in such sort as it was written. So the posts went with the letters from the king and the princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And be not ye like your fathers and like your brethren which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as ye see. Now be ye not stiff-necked 
and your, as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. And if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you if ye turn unto him. Now think about that message. Nineteen kings, and he's sending word to the northern kingdom. Nineteen kings, all evil. They're about to be taken by Assyria. He says, if you turn now, God will have mercy on you. After 19 kings of wickedness and idolatry. What a God of mercy. We keep reading. Notice verse 10. So the post passed from city to city throughout, through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was given to them, notice, one heart, to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars of incense took they away, and cast into the brook Kidron. Then they killed the Passover on the fourteenth day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests sprinkled the blood which they received of the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passovers for every one that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. For a multitude of people... Even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise that it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary, and the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah, and he healed the people. I want to draw your attention, if you would, to verse number 12, where the Bible says that in Judah the, the hand of God was to give them, notice, one heart to do the commandment of the king of the princes by the word of the Lord. Think about that expression, one heart. If you go back to, or uh, further in the chapter to verse 18, at the end, the Bible says that Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon everyone, notice that prepareth his heart to seek God. I want to preach this evening on this thought as Hezekiah is continuing here to bring the people back to God. I want us to consider this as we continue in, this, in the life of Hezekiah, the people of one heart. You know, this, this reformation, this transformation that's taking place in uh, the southern kingdom, and really that's going to affect a little bit of the northern kingdom as we see in this passage, is not just an outside, outward manifestation. It's not just a physical cleansing of washing your hands physically and of cleaning the temple. It's not just a getting rid of the idols. It's not just a getting rid of the altars. This is all about having one heart. Bringing back the heart of the people where the heart of the people should have been a long time ago. So before we uh, neglect and think, well, the Old Testament is all about the law and the rituals and what you have to do and conform in a physical sense of the, uh, uh, of, of the rituals, uh, but that's not so. God has always been interested in the heart. Because when He has the heart, it takes care of the rest. You see, it's easy to conform on the outside. It would have been easy at that time for many people to come to Jerusalem and to do all the things that they were supposed to do and uh, physically wash themselves and purify themselves and bring the sacrifices and to do those things physically. But the emphasis of this passage is God is trying to get a hold of their hearts. Because if it's just the physical manifestation, it's not going to last very long because it's not real. Now in this passage it is clear as we read here that we are dealing here with the feast that we refer to as the Passover. 
The Passover, by the way, is a most significant religious feast. To the Jew, perhaps, the most significant feast. You say, well, why is that? Because of two reasons. First of all, it commemorates Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Uh, It's quite significant. And number two, because it communicates the deliverance from sin's bondage. It's twofold. It's not just Israel thinking about their, uh, their deliverance from Israel, but it's also thinking about the deliverance from the death angel. It's twofold. A physical deliverance, but also a deliverance from sin. And we know the Passover, what commemorated that. Uh, the commandment was to give all the uh, children of Israel, had to slay a lamb, and they had to, uh, 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 to paint the blood on the doorpost. And as the death angel would pass and see the blood, he would pass over them. That's why it's called the Passover. Over. Very significant feast for those two reasons. But as we understand in the New Testament, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said this, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye have unleavened, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So who is our Passover today? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Passover. You see, the Passover is also called in the Word of God the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We see that in this passage that we read this evening. The Passover feast uh, the first uh, is the first really of three feasts uh, which the Jews were required to observe in Jerusalem. The two other feasts would be the Feast of Harvest, uh, which was uh, something that was done every year, and also the Feast of Ingathering. Now those two feasts are important, but they're not as important as the fe- the Passover. Passover feast. You see, it is evident in Scripture that the Israelites went years without observing the Passover, as we just read. The Bible says here it had been a long time that they had observed the Passover. You know, as we, as in our study of the Word of God, we think about the Passover and we think that it ought to be mentioned a lot, but really it's not mentioned a whole lot. Now, we know it was observed more than it is mentioned, but it is only mentioned seven times when it was actually observed. In Exodus chapter 12, in Numbers chapter 9, Joshua chapter 5, 2 Chronicles 30, where we find ourselves, 2 Chronicles 35, Ezra 6, and Luke chapter 22. Uh, where we see the Passover being kept. Now we're going to study this passage as Hezekiah led the people in observing the Passover. But let's stop and say this. As we look at all those outward things that were done, may we not neglect to understand that this was about the heart. It was about the heart. You know, we can know all the truth, we can do all the right things, but if our heart is not right with God, then all those things shall be in vain. So the heart, needs, the heart of the matter needs to be dealt with. As we consider this passage, I want us to see, first of all, the preparation for the Passover. The preparation for the Passover. Notice the Bible says in verse 5, So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not done it for a long time in such sort as it was written. So we see here again, you say, well, what is it that prompted that? Well, if we go back to verse 2, the Bible says, For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. Now again, there, are, there was a, a spirit of revival here because... Up to this point, Hezekiah has been a leader. He is basically told, if we, as we read the previous passages, he says, all right, get rid of the altars. Get rid of the high places. Do it now. <laughs> and then we see in the temple, he says, uh, Levites and priests, remember, he brought them uh, to, uh, out in the streets, uh, right in front of the temple. He says, you see the temple? You're going to go sanctify yourselves, and then you're going to go sanctify the temple. You're going to make sure to replace all the vessels. You're going to make sure you take out the pagan altar and put all the right altar in there. And so uh, Hezekiah had been proactive, and we saw last time that he brought the people back to a true place of worship. And the people are leaving this place, and there's excitement. The people truly worship God. God, and now people are leaving uh, the temple, they're rejoicing, and there is a revival going on. There's such a spirit of revival that the Bible says that uh, there is a, the princes are there, and the congregation in Jerusalem, notice, uh, to keep the Passover, uh, they're counseling the, uh, the, the king, and they're saying, hey, Hezekiah, uh, there is this thing that we haven't observed in quite some time, but it's called the Passover feast, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I think it's time for us to do that again. 
You see, it seems as we read the text that, uh, that uh, king, the king is taking counsel from the princes and all the congregation. So this came from the people. So may I say that what Hezekiah has done has been working. Because now the people are being revived. They truly worship God in the temple. They brought the sacrifices and they're thinking, this is what it ought to be like. And therefore, they said, hey, how about we keep going here and observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread? You know, it is always encouraging to see a group of people with the same desire as Hezekiah. You see, Hezekiah did not just bark out orders, but he also took counsel here. And the counsel was to keep the Passover. Notice, now notice here, they mention here the Passover, and at the end it says, in the second month. Now, if we study the Word of God, we'd understand that according to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5, the Bible says in the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Now, we understand based upon the Word of God that it is instructed to be in the first month and in the, on the 14th day. That's pretty specific, but yet here they're saying in the second month. Well, there's a reason for that. I want us to go back to Numbers chapter 9, if you would, because there is a clause in the Word of God that gives an option if the first month on the 14th day is not available, there is a second option. Notice Numbers chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, that the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month, at even, ye shall keep it in his, in his appointed season, according to all the rites of it, and according to all the ceremonies thereof shall ye keep it. So that's the first month, the fourteenth day. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month at even in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man, that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back, that we may not offer an offering of the Lord in his appointed season among the children of Israel? And Moses said unto them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or be in a journey afar off yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord the fourteenth day of the second month at even they shall keep it and eat it with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs so there is a clause in the law that said that if you were not available to keep it on the first month that you ought to keep it on the second month but still on the fourteenth day so the question is, why the delay in this passage? Uh, why did they have to delay to on the second month? Well, uh, let's study a little bit the reasons for the delay. First of all, we see the number one reason is because the priests were not sanctified. Uh, the Verse 3, the Bible tells us, for they could not keep it at that time. Notice, the Bible answers the question for us. Because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. Now, in our last study, we noted that some of the priests had not sanctified themselves. He's not talking about all the priests. When he says that the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, you remember when people were bringing their sacrifices in the last chapter? And the Bible says that as they were skinning the sacrifices, they found that not all the priests were there. Why? Because not all the priests had sanctified themselves. And so here we come now to this place, and the Bible says here, we cannot keep the Passover. Why? Because not all the priests have sanctified themselves. You see, at the Passover, there would be a greater number of sacrifices to be offered. And if they struggled with the sacrifices in the temple worship just a chapter ago, they surely would struggle with more sacrifices that are being offered at the Passover. You say, well, why do you say that? Because remember here, as the invitation is about to go out to invite the whole nation of Israel for the Passover, it's not just for the people in Jerusalem, as what's been taking place here so far. This is an invitation to everybody from Dan even to Beersheba. That's all of Israel, so there's going to be a great crowd. So they're saying here, we cannot start the Passover now. Why? Because we're not ready. 
the priests are not sanctified. God is interested in us being prepared to serve Him. And when we are prepared to serve Him, it means that we are clean. God is interested in a clean vessel that He wants to use. Sure, He uses an unclean vessel all the time, I'm sure. But don't you think He would rather use a clean vessel? He uses us despite us. But let's allow the Lord to use us because we're right with Him. Because we are a clean vessel. So the reason for the delays, first of all, the priests were not sanctified. But there's a second reason. Because the people were not assembled. The Bible tells us again in verse 3. Notice, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. Now, again, the times that these people lived in were not like ours. Hezekiah could not send out a mass email, okay, to the people and say, we're going to observe the Passover, make your way to Jerusalem now. He could not pay for an ad on television uh, so that the television ad would go throughout all of Israel and say, come, it's time for the Passover. He could not do that. He could not put a little message on Facebook and advertise. He could not do that. He had to send a messenger, a runner, if you would, to go throughout all of the land and to get the information out. And so the Bible simply says here, to get the the, the people to come to the Passover feast would take many days of preparation, not only for them, the priests are not ready, but also for all the people. It was basically a short pilgrimage for the Jews as they would come from, some of them, over 75 miles, uh, come down and make this trip. They had to prepare several days, and then they would have to be away from their home for several days. So there's much preparation. So the, the, the reasons here for the delay in the Passover, uh, the reason why it's not going to be on the first month, on the 14th day, but the second month, the 14th day, is because the priests are not sanctified, because the people were not assembled, but number three, because the place was not purified. If you go back to chapter 29, in verse 17, notice what the Bible says. Now, They began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to uh, to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. So, quick question here, uh, class. When did they finish cleaning the temple? What day? The sixteenth day. When is the Passover supposed to start? The fourteenth day. So there's a problem. You see, the Passover could not be started because the temple was not clean until the 16th day. Two days after the Passover was supposed to start. Again, the Passover was to start on the 14th day. But the temple was not done until the 16th day of the first. We say, well, well what's, the, what's, what's the big deal? What's the difference between 14th and 16th day? Because the 14th day is when Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's why it's so important. That's why it has to be always kept on the 14th day. It's important. Now, the work of God. When is the work of God hindered? The work of God is hindered when there is a lack of purity. You see, there must be a private purity as seen in the priests, but also a public purity as seen in the temple. And they go together, by the way. Because the cleansing of the priest, you remember what the instruction was? Was for them to cleanse themselves First, and then cleanse the temple. Take care of yourself, your own personal life first, and then you can take care of cleaning the temple. Because it is possible for us, okay, to clean the outside, to clean the temple, but not necessarily have a clean heart. But it's impossible to clean our hearts and not clean the temple. So we see here the delay, the reasons for the delay. The priests were not sanctified, the people were not assembled, and the place was not purified. We don't see the reasons for the delay, but number two, we see the reach in the delay. Verse 6 of 2 Chronicles chapter 30 says this, So the posts went with the letters from the king and the princes throughout all of Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you and are, that are escaped out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Now I want you to notice the word in verse 6, so the posts. Now the word post here literally means a runner. Okay, that's what it is. Uh, We could say a postman. Okay, he's the mailman. Uh, He delivers, right, the message, 
Right, brother, he worked with FedEx. It's the same thing. He drives around and delivers packages, delivers messages. Uh, so basically, these uh, uh, men would be runners. They would run from location to location. They would bring the letter. The letter was supposed to be read with the message. Uh, it would be kind of like, uh, uh, basically in old times, uh, they would go perhaps into a village, and then they would read the letter out loud, and everybody was to listen. And then when they were done, they would close the letter. They would go to the next town and do the same thing. So, as we consider the reach in the delay, who are they trying to reach? I want us to consider, first of all, the extent of the reach. The Bible says in verse 5, So they established a degree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, notice, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. Now, Beersheba is, a, is the southernmost part of Israel, and Dan is the northernmost part of the land of Israel. So this invitation went beyond just Judah, but also to Israel and all of the northern kingdom. Now, up to this point, I don't think we've seen that anywhere because the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom has been quite divided. If you find, if you study the, the minor prophets and the major prophets, many of them who were in the southern kingdom at times were called to go to the north and preach to the north. And what happened is many times they would make, they, they would make fun of them and they would be rejected. And by the way, out of the 19 kings, 19 of them were bad. So it was not like a pleasant thing uh, for them uh, to go to the northern kingdom. But here Hezekiah said, let's go to the northern kingdom. You know what he's saying? Let's give him one more chance. Assyria was knocking at the door. They were about to be taken captive, and everybody knew that because he admits that right here. He says, notice, that, you're, that you escape out of the hand of the king of Assyria. There already had people had been taken captive out of the nation of Israel, Assyria. It was only a matter of time before the whole entire nation was taken captive uh, with just leaving a few people to pay the tribute there in the land. And so we see that the extent of the reach is to all of Israel. This was not a call for political unity. It was a call for religious unity. He was saying... Turn from your false gods and come worship the true and living God in Jerusalem who you haven't done for many years. That's the extent of the reach. The reach and the delay, we see not only the extent of the reach, but we see the exhortation and the reach. Uh, what is the exhortation? Again, verse 6, he says in the middle of the verse, he says, notice, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. By the way, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. You know what he's saying? He says, we're all the same people here. <laughs> You're not any different than us. You come from the same heritage. You come from the lineage of Abraham, of Isaac, and Israel. We are all Israelites. He says, and he will return the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the king. You see the promise here? This is the bold a prediction that Hezekiah makes. He says, look, if you just turn and come back to Jerusalem and worship God, those that are a part of your family that have already been taken captive by Assyria, they're going to come back. That's a pretty bold prediction. And that means that if they did that, they would not be in bondage to Assyria anymore. Now we know it is during the reign of Hezekiah that the northern kingdom is taken into captivity. Now we're going to see in just a moment, they mocked those messengers. And therefore, they were taken captive uh, just a few short years after that. And so think about here, it's almost like a last chance. It's almost like after 19 kings and all of those years of worshiping false gods and bowing down to, idola, uh, to, to idols and to offering their own children to, as sacrifices to false gods, after all those years, there's still an appeal from God. It says, if you turn back and return, God will spare you. He goes on in verse 7, he says, And be not like your fathers, and like your brethren which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as ye see. <laughs> look, he's saying, look, look around you. Don't you see the, the devastation of idolatry? Don't you see uh, the devastation of paganism? Don't you see how everything is ruined around you? How you're uh, uh, under heavy tribute from the Assyrians and how you, 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 your families are ruined. You've lost your homes. You've lost your way of life. And you've lost everything. Just open your eyes. He says in verse 8 now, Be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into the, His sanctuary which He hath sanctified forever and serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of His wrath may turn away from you. 
For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into the, this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away His face from you if ye return unto Him. God is sitting there ready and available and says, I'll just restore you. I've already made the step. There's the message. You just come back. And it never happened. Now, there was a small remnant that came from the north, and we'll see that a little later. Verse 10, he says, So the post, notice, passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even into Zebulun. And notice, But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. You see, the extent was all of Israel. The exhortation was, Turn back to God, and He'll restore you. But we also see the experience of the reach. What's the experience? They go from village to village. They go to the village, they read the letter. Return to God, and He'll restore your land, He'll restore your families, and He'll bring you back from your captivity. Ah, are you, that's a joke, man. Do you really believe that? Does your king even believe that? And they ridiculed those messengers. And they made fun of them. And they belittled them. And they mocked them. And they scorned them. It would just be a few years later that those same people that scorned and mocked them were taken captive by the Assyrians. You see, the experience of the reach, we see that many rejected. And the fact is, things have not changed a whole lot. As we go out and give the gospel and give the message of the Lord, many are going to reject. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if anybody told you, but perhaps if you give the gospel out, you're going to be made fun of. You're going to be scorned and you're going to be mocked. Well, that's not what I expected. That's just reality. You see, that's the experience of the reach. But we don't see that many rejected, but some received. <laughs> Notice verse 7. The, the Bible says, uh, or um, verse 11, Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. What's the key word there? Humbled. They heard the message and they humbled themselves. That's the only difference there. Humility. You see, the reason why the other ones mocked and scorned is because of their pride. That's, why, that's, that, 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 that's the reason. They said, I, I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to admit that I need God. I'm not going to admit like you. Look, you're, you're, you're just the weak. You need God just like as a crutch to carry you through life. That's why you need God. Well, who's got the crutch now? You see, they were taken captive, not the nation of Judah, but, the Bible says, some received. And you know it is the same with the message. Many will reject and mock. But can I say, some will receive. Some will humble themselves. Some will come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people will repent of their sin and trust Christ as their Savior. So therefore, we must be faithful. There was no stipulation in this messenger. He says, deliver the message. That's all they said. They didn't say, stop reading the letter if they mock you. If they reject you, just leave and come back to Jerusalem. No, they had a responsibility. And the responsibility is to go to every town and every city and to proclaim the message. Period. So these people, they left. And do you see, do you see the scene? There's some people that were there that were mocking. And I, I am sure that there were people that were standing there that weren't mocking. They were just kind of listening. And as those runners left, went to the next town, they thought to themselves, let's make preparation to go to Jerusalem. You see, these runners perhaps, in the midst of all that confrontation, did not know that anybody had a change of mind and a change of heart but some did 
So we not only see here the preparation for the Passover, but number two, we see the particulars of the Passover. The Bible says in verse uh, number 14, And they arose, and notice, and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars for incense took they away, and cast them into the brook Kidron. I want us to look at several things here, because the particulars of the Passover here, and we're going to see several things that happen uh, in this Passover, in the preparation for this Passover. But again in verse 12, the Bible says, Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. The keeping the commandment of the Lord must come from the heart. Do we get that? The keeping of the commandments of the Lord must come from the heart. You see, there was to be one heart in Jerusalem. And by the way, humility among these people is what brought them to this, to this one heart. A humility and a humbling in the sight of God. So as we consider the particulars of this uh, Passover, we see first of all the sanctifying of the Passover. So what happens here? The Bible says... And there assembled in verse 13 at Jerusalem much people to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great congregation. It's almost like it's, it wasn't expected because they're saying a very great congregation. Now we know that many people rejected it, but it still did not keep from there being a great congregation. There was a lot of people there. And so what happens when they all get there and they're ready, think about it, they're all coming to Jerusalem, people that have been away from Jerusalem for a very long time, people that have not kept this particular Passover for a very long time, there's a great congregation here, it's the second month, it's about to be the 14th day, and the Bible says in verse 14, and they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars, for instance, took they away and cast them into the brook Kidron. And I want to say, who told them to do that? I don't see any orders from Hezekiah. Do you, do you here in this passage? Hezekiah doesn't say, all right, do that. The people did it. They came to Jerusalem and said, here, we're here for the Passover. What's... Is that an altar over there? Is, is that a pagan altar? Take, let's take care of it. What's that? There's another one. It's on every street corner. Hey, before we get started here, we got to get rid of all those things. You see, there had to be a sanctifying for the Passover to take place. The city of Jerusalem needed to be ready for this Passover. Uh, if you go back to 2 Chronicles in chapter 28, notice in verse 24 of 2 Chronicles 28, 24. This is during the reign of Ahaz, Hezekiah's father. Okay, bad guy, very bad guy. Verse 24 says this, And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God, and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God, and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. So he shuts the temple of God, and uh, he gets rid of that. He shuts the door, he destroys everything, and he ravages the temple. And what he does as a substitute is he raises up altars on every street corner. In ev the Bible says in every corner in Jerusalem. You see, you've you got to give the people a substitute. Uh, you got to give uh, the people uh, something to do, uh, someone to worship, uh, something to serve. But it's got to be a substitute. It can't be the temple that's shut. Boy, if that's not today's philosophy, I don't know what is. People are trying to replace true biblical Christianity and substitute it with everything imaginable. No wonder there are over 5,000 churches that close their doors every month in our country. Why? Because people want to substitute. People want to substitute something that is, that is, uh, that is not, uh, that, 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 they, that, that they deem, wow, it's uh, old-fashioned, so uh, let's get rid of it and let's have uh, cell groups. Oh, let, let, let's do something else because uh, this uh, church house thing or, or this, this church thing is not working. So let's have life groups where we do life together. And there's no true worship. There's no truly people getting in the Word of God and people humbling themselves. People say, we've got to change things. Can I say... This is where they got doing that. Do, do we see here how, how they got? 
The state of Christian, Christians in general is alarming to me. We as Christians, let's get rid of some wrong thoughts in our minds. We are not struggling with too much holiness. We are struggling with too much worldliness. Where the people of God want to be so much like the world. And I want to say, how has that worked? Not very well. Not very well at all. You see, there had to be a sanctifying of the The people, again, this is the outflow of what's taking place. They're, they're of one heart. Do you see that? They're coming here, and God has knit their hearts together because they've all humbled themselves before God. Because they have a genuine heart. And it, just out of the blue, they're like, that, that's not right, what I see over there. Because there's only one place where we worship God, and that's the, at the temple. Let's get rid of all those things. You see, we see the sanctifying the Passover, but number two, we see the significance of the Passover. What happens at the Passover? Well, if you go down to verse number 15 of 2 Chronicles 30, the Bible says, <clears throat> Then, notice, they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. So think about the significance of this Passover. The Bible says they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month. Now, the Passover means this, the lamb. People were to bring at the Passover a lamb without blemish. That is the Passover. When the Bible says they killed the Passover, that's what they say, they killed the lamb. <laughs> okay? Uh, the lamb, again, in John 1, 29, you remember when John the Baptist uh, uh, saw Jesus Christ, what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ is the Lamb. You see, as we consider the significance of the Passover, we see the deed is significant. You see, this is important. Uh, the reason why they killed the Passover is important because Christ had to die. As these lambs died year after year. And no, as the skeptics may claim, Jesus Christ did not faint on the cross. He literally died, was buried, and after three days, he literally raised from the dead. That really happened. You see, that's why this is significant. The deed is significant. They killed the Passover. It was not acceptable to offer a sacrifice and have a lamb alive. No, that doesn't work. It had to be killed. The deed is significant, but also, number two, the day is significant. The Bible says it was the 14th day. They were able to change the month, but not the day. Well, why is that? You see, this day is important because of two reasons. First of all, it was commanded to be done on the 14th day. That's why it's important, because it was commanded to be done on the 14th day. But number two is because it was when Christ was crucified. On the 14th day. Now, Easter is celebrated at a different time each year. I don't know why they change it every year. I think it's the first time they had it on April 1st. But the scripture gives us a specific time for the crucifixion and the resurrection. The crucifixion happened on the 14th day. And the resurrection happened on the first day of the week. We know that specifically. So that's why, that's the significance of, of this Passover. We see the sanctifying of the Passover, the significance of the Passover. But number three, we see the stumbling in the Passover. Verse 15, the Bible says, notice... <clears throat> then they killed the Passover on the 14th day. The they is talking about the people. And the Bible says, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed. And uh, I was thinking, I was, what do you mean they were ashamed? Well, the word ashamed here means this. It means to be in a state of dishonor. It means disgrace. The question is, why were they ashamed? You see, these actions of the people in Jerusalem shamed the priests and the Levites. Why? Because many of them still had not sanctified themselves. Many of them still hadn't. And so here they're looking at the enthusiasm of the people. They're supposed to be the religious leaders. 
They're supposed to be the ones that give the example. And here as they see all the people bringing uh, bringing, uh, their sacrifices, and they see all those sacrifices being offered, and they see the enthusiasm and the energy and the commitment of the people, they're ashamed, they're disgraced, they're dishonored because of their own spiritual state. And so what happens as a result of that? The Bible says, notice, the Levites were ashamed and sanctify themselves that's the right response to being ashamed it's well go ahead and sanctify yourself you know many people I fear uh, they get ashamed and, and they just crawl in the corner and don't do anything about it if there's something you're ashamed about get it right with God well, I just, I've, I've tried over and over and over again uh, to, uh, to ask the Lord to give me victory over the sin. I just still don't have victory. Then try again. Do it again. Get in the Word. Pray. Ask for forgiveness again. When you're ashamed, sanctify yourself. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I like that verse because if we confess our sins, he says, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, there are things that we've done that we don't even remember, that we're not aware, even aware of. But if we deal with the sins that we know that we're ashamed of, then he cleanses us from all sin. He makes a way for even the things that we forgot about. You see, after they were ashamed, they sanctified themselves. So we see the sanctifying for the Passover, the significance of the Passover, the stumbling in the Passover. But number four, we see the supplication in the Passover. So Hezekiah is going to pray. He sees all this taking place. And notice verse 18, the Bible says, For a multitude of the people, notice, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not cleansed themselves, Yet did they eat the Passover otherwise, that it is, uh, th- then it was written. But Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, The good Lord pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. You see, the Passover lamb... <clears throat> We know it was not just to be killed, but according to those verses uh, a little earlier, was supposed to be eaten. You see, that signifies something. Christ saves people by His blood, but also Christ provides nourishment for daily walk and obedience. It was not just a sacrifice. It was, you see, they were to eat the sacrifice to signify that Christ would not only forgive their sin, but would give us the, the, the wherewithal to live a life that's pleasing to Him. You see, Christ is not only our Savior, but He is also our strength. Hezekiah therefore goes to the Lord in prayer here. As he kind of sees the setting, and he prays. This is happening at the Passover. And I want us to consider the things that he prayed for. First of all, consider several things about his prayer. First of all, we see the reason for the plea. The reason for the plea is because these, some of these Levites had not, or some of these people, notice from Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun, and Ephraim, notice in verse 18, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. So these people, think about it, in the northern kingdom, some of the people that were reached came down to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. God was dealing with their hearts, but they did not, uh, because of all these years being away from the Word of God, they probably just totally forgot what they were supposed to do, and they weren't taught properly by their fathers and mothers what to do in those cases. And so they come, and they're there and offering sacrifices, and they're eating the Passover, and Hezekiah says, they haven't cleansed themselves. They haven't sanctified themselves. But Hezekiah knows their heart. They're here in Jerusalem for a reason. And that's not to worship a false god like they've been doing. And so you know what he does? He says, I know they're not doing the right thing, but he prays for them. You see, the reason for their plea is because they had not cleansed themselves. We don't see the reason for the plea, but we see the request of the plea. What's the request? 
Hezekiah simply says this, the good Lord pardon everyone. Forgive them. They're, 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 they're not aware of what they're doing. But then he goes and deals with the root in the plea. He says this in verse 19. The good Lord pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God. You see what Hezekiah said? He said, look, they're, Lord, they're not doing it according to what you said they were supposed to do it in observing the Passover. But Lord, I, I can't help but know their, the desire of their heart is to please the Lord. They just don't know. So, Lord, would you forgive them? Let me ask you this. Do you think that these people that came from Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, and Ephraim, who came with a heart, desire to please God? And they're coming, and they're showing up there at the, the Passover, and they're offer sacrifice, and now it's time for them to eat the sacrifice and to eat the Passover. Do you think because of their heart that they would have had a problem if Hezekiah came and said, hey, listen, you know, you have a sincere heart, but I want to tell you that the way you're doing things is not right. You, you need to sanctify yourselves before you offer the sacrifice. And then you need to eat the Passover. Do you think if their heart was what it says it was like. Do you think they would have had a problem with that? They would have said, okay, let's, let's do it. Uh, you see, the Bible says here, that prepareth his heart, notice, to seek the Lord, the Lord of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah, and he healed the people. People will have problems doing what God wants them to do because their heart is not right with Him. People will have problems doing what God wants them to do because their heart is not right with Him. But there are many people, perhaps young Christians and perhaps some that don't know any better, that just do things out of desire, please, Lord, and sometimes they do the wrong thing. And here Hezekiah prays for these people because they're doing the wrong thing. He's going to correct that. But he says, can you forgive them? Because their heart is in the right place, but they simply have not been taught. You see, today in, among in the, the, the Christian circle, there's a problem with people that says, well... I'll take the salvation thing. But you do not preach on me having to do anything. I have a problem with that. Then the problem is the heart. You see, when someone has a genuine heart, they're, they're not going to say, ah, you tell me to do this, I don't want to do this, I'm done. Someone that has a true heart's desire will say, well, would you show me where it says it? Would you teach me? Would you let me know why we do what we do? You see, that's a heart's desire. And these people, no doubt, had a heart's desire. And that's why Hezekiah asked and said, Would you forgive them? And the Bible says, And God healed them. He healed them. He forgave them. Because they didn't do the right things. But may I say, Hezekiah was not silent he would go back and tell them how to do the right thing and how to do it right from now on. May the Lord help all of us to simply, would we, would we all say this out of just a heart's desire? If we truly love the Lord and say, Lord, help me to humble myself before you. And if there's anything that I see in your word that I ought to do and your Holy Spirit points it out to me, I now confess I will submit to that. Because I just want to please you. That should be our heart's desire. To say, there's, thing, there's a lot of things I don't know in the Word of God. But if I see it in the Word of God, I'll do it. You see, these people did everything that they knew. 
but their heart was the issue. You see, you can deal and instruct and teach someone who may not know everything, but whose heart is right with the Lord. But you cannot teach and instruct someone who knows everything, whose heart is not right with the Lord. You see, peop some people have already settled in their lives. They've already settled some things that they say, I'm not, doing, I'm not changing that in my life. Some people have already determined that in their lives. I'm not changing that. Then that's a heart problem. That's a heart problem. May the Lord help us to humble ourselves and say, Lord, whatever it is, okay, I'll do it. Well, I haven't been doing it from now on. It's okay. The Lord will, the Lord will forgive you if your heart is right, if your heart is sincere. And may the Lord help us. I look at that and I, 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 I'm encouraged to think the people here, the emphasis is they were of one heart. What was the one heart? According to the passage, I believe it was a heart of humility. Some people mocked, scorned, but others humbled themselves. And humility will be very good for our souls. Humility in relationship, but specifically more than anything else, humility towards God. And say, God, I'll submit to you whatever you want me to do.